So I'm on the Zoom screen right now, and uh, well, it's not showing me if somebody's online. But anyway, I thank God for the people that are joining. I thank God for the people that are going to uh, listen to this recorded as well. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I believe. I'm bringing in a revolution at this time. That's what I believe, you know, because God is working in me and God has told me to preach this at this time. And so many people have asked me, this is a really difficult time. And how can you preach raising the dead at this time? And I indeed see so many people, you know, I might have known in the past, uh, they are silent about these issues. But it's not that I'm comparing myself with anyone. But I must be faithful to what God has told me to do. And I'm going to run my race. I am going to run the race and do what God told me to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let me ask you, when do you need the light? Do you need the light when it's all bright? Everything is going fine. Or do you need the light when it's the most darkest? You know, as people are dying with COVID, not just COVID, there are many other sicknesses that are taking people's lives. But COVID has been highlighted in recent times. So let me just talk about that. So when people are dying in such, you know, such massive numbers and so easily, people are dying so easily. This is the time to preach that the dead can be raised, that death has been defeated. You don't have to die, my friends, my brothers and sisters. You do not need to die. You do not need to suffer. The Bible is very clear. Jesus became the substitute. Jesus became the vicarious sacrifice, the atoning victim. He became the Lamb of God. Okay, if we have to suffer again, what good is the sacrifice of Jesus? Okay, so I'm going to tell you why I'm preaching that the dead can be raised. That death is not where the, you know, the ball stops. That's not where the game stops. If you're praying for someone to be healed and they die, you need to move on to the next command. Let me go to Matthew chapter 10, verse 8. So today's title is for us, you know, a commissioned to raise the dead. Commissioned to raise the dead. Just like you're commissioned into the military and you're assigned a mission. Most people don't even know that Jesus has commissioned us to raise the dead. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. At other places, also in you know Luke and uh, uh, Mark, it is also translated as the kingdom of God. Okay, nevertheless, kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. You know, kingdom talks about a king's dominion. The reign, the rule, the authority, the kingly power, you know, the area where a kingly power exercises his power. That's what kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God means. So when I say the kingdom of God, it means the realm where God is ruling and exercising his dominion. And when I'm saying, you know, the reign of God, the very dominion of God is here and is available now. That's what Jesus is telling us to preach. So when I'm preaching that the kingdom of God is available for people to enter in, then it cannot be without power. Paul says, my gospel is not just with preaching in vain words or words in the wisdom of men, but it is in the demonstration of the power of the Spirit of God. That's what Jesus goes on to say. He not only preached the kingdom of heaven, which is at hand, available to enter in, but 10th verse, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received freely give i want you to notice the terminology he says heal the sick as if it's a job that is assigning to you it could be something like this go pick up that bucket or go move that bucket okay it is very simply and very you know casually saying go heal the sick okay remember he's not saying go pray for the sick go intercede for the sick Okay, we need to get this straight. The tone, you know, the way of speaking is as if that is something you can do and you must do and it is not difficult to do. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. 
you know, if you check the word for cast out, it's ekbalo in Greek. It's very harsh word, very rude word. It's like if a stranger has uh, entered into your house and you don't want them there, you cast them by the throat or by the neck and push them out. It is also, uh, you know, it also means something like this. If something has stuck to your hand, pulling it out, you know, separating it from your hand. That's what ekbalo means, which means, which is translated as cast out. So when he says cast out demons, he does not mean negotiate with demons. He's not asking, try to see if you can persuade them to go out. You know, this is a very aggressive, very serious and very firm command to his disciples. Heal the sick. Okay, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers. And Jesus is assuming or believing that you are able to do this. You are capable of doing this. And it is nothing to plead with God about. That's the idea, whole idea here. And in the same tone of voice, the same tone of voice is saying, raise the dead. He's putting four things in one category of, you know, uh, performance of the word of God, healing the sick, casting out demons, cleansing the lepers and raising the dead. He does not think raising the dead is any special. You need to let that sink in. Okay. It's in one breath, one single statement, heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Okay. Raise the dead. It's something like, go wake up that sleeping person. Why is he still asleep? And in technicality, that's the word. It's egero in in Greek, which the very first meaning of that is to awaken someone who is in sleep. Okay, cause them to rise up. So it does not even, you know, the word does not even uh, talk about bringing someone back to life. That can be a derived meaning from it. But the very idea here is, okay, go wake up that sleeping person. And the scripture does talk about dead people in ter terminology, which indicates that they are sleeping. Okay, minister heal, heal the sick, cast out demons, cleanse the lepers raise the dead and who is it talking to he's talking to his disciples so someone you know super spiritual or uh, someone who does not want to take responsibility they can come up now and say okay he's talking about he's talking this to the apostles they were the apostles and it is not for us today first of all you know you need to come out of the cave the rat hole that you've been hiding because you don't know the testimonies of God. Okay, the dead are being raised worldwide. Just because you don't think they are raised does not mean that they are not raised. Okay, I'll leave it at that. All right, so to counter you, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things. How many things? All things. You are supposed to make disciples, which means pass on whatever Jesus has taught you. And teaching them or teaching them to observe all things meaning what obeying every command that was laid out so it cannot be that there are certain commands for the disciples and certain commands for us now no the bible says jesus does not change he is the same yesterday today and forever okay and who are these people that are supposed to do it the disciples okay a common disciple is supposed to obey everything that was given or handed down to the apostles Mark chapter 16. You might have known that very well. Let me go there. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, 16, talk about preaching the good news. Okay. And 17, 18, talk about the signs and wonders that are following. So 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover fully well. Fully well, remember that, fully well. Okay, so it is the same idea, convinced the same idea, the preaching of the kingdom of God, or the gospel of God, and accompanying signs following that. Just check out the verse, 
let me continue to 1920. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word. Did you catch that? Confirming the word. So God confirms the word with signs following, he's saying. So what is God confirming? God is not confirming an apostle, pastor, preacher, teacher, or your position or your status in a church or outside in the secular world. He's confirming the word. Now let me ask you, if you never preach that the dead can be raised, what is he going to confirm? If you don't even, I mean, allow people to have an idea that yes, it is possible, how can they even have faith? Let me go to Romans chapter 10. Verse 13 onwards, Romans 10, 13 onwards. For whosoever, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So why am I preaching all this? So that you can believe, so that you can know and understand that God still raises the dead, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Bible says, escape from death, escape from death belongs unto the Lord. Romans 4.17 says, He is a God who quickens the dead, causes the dead to live, He gives them life. John 5.21, Jesus said, I only do what I see my Father do. And as the Father quickens the dead, so shall the Son also quicken whom He wills. Okay, this is all tied up. So unless I preach or someone preaches to you and tells, tells you that the resurrection of the dead is possible, that death is not the end of God's power. Okay, it's not like if this is death, God's hand can only reach till here and he cannot, you know, go beyond and bring someone from the death. Is the Lord's hand short? Come on, I'm talking to someone. I know that. Is the Lord's hand short? Is the resurrection of Jesus not your foundation? Okay, is that not the basis of your faith in Christ Jesus, that he was raised from the dead? If he was raised from the dead, why do you think he cannot raise anyone else from the dead? Okay, so this is saying, how shall they know if no one preaches it? So I am here to shine light on God's word, or rather allow the light of God's word to shine upon you. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings. Okay, I can hear someone saying, this is talking about the gospel. Yes, yes. And I'm saying, preach the full gospel. That Jesus Christ died in behalf of every man. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. Okay, he died for every man, in behalf of every man. It says he tasted death for every man. So this person who has died does not need to taste death. Okay, you're saying uh, he's talking about a spiritual death. No, my friend. Did Jesus die only a spiritual death? Or did Jesus, did Jesus die a spiritual death? No, his blood was physical. His stripes were physical. His death was physical, if you don't understand. His body was buried in a grave. And he arose physically. Hallelujah. And you're a physical being. Come on. You have a spirit, yes, but you are, you know, your totality includes your physical part of your being. And Hebrews 2, 14, 15 clearly said, through death he destroyed him that had the power of death. So it clearly says that the devil that was having the power of death does not hold it anymore. Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Jesus says, look at me, I died, but I'm alive now forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades, or we can have to say, death and the grave because that's the same word Hades is used for grave Sheol in the Old Testament I'm going to touch on that again so let me just continue here verse 16 10 16 Romans but they have not all obeyed the gospel for Isaiah says Lord who has believed our report so it is possible that if someone preaches you the good news or brings you the total gospel that you may not believe it but I am preaching for those 
who are ready to believe the harvest is ripe that's what the word of god says i believe there are people who are hungry for the truth of god's word who shall not be satisfied for a mere form of religion devoid of the power and godliness so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god what happens when faith comes that whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved the lord is a savior if someone shall call upon him to deliver from death you know god can deliver but how does the faith come it comes by preaching and teaching by bringing god's word i communicate to you what are the intents of god's you know what is the intent of god's heart what is the purpose of god and god says go raise the dead so i just showed you from the scripture you know who can raise the dead any disciple of the lord jesus christ can raise the dead in fact you are commissioned we see that you cannot separate the preaching of the gospel from also healing the sick casting out demons you know setting people free from sickness disease and raising the dead why do we conveniently leave it out so faith is coming to you right now my friends faith is based on knowledge we it is true that we all have the faith of god we are once we are born again you know the nature of the spirit the new spirit that we have galatians chapter 5 verse 20 to 23 faith is of the spirit faith is a fruit of your spirit so you have the very faith of god but faith cannot act if it does not know that there is an opportunity to act so you know faith is based on knowledge so right now the knowledge of god is coming to you that you are commissioned you are commissioned to raise the dead hallelujah you are commissioned to raise the dead you have heard now today that god has commissioned every disciple to obey whatever he commanded the original apostles or disciples and you cannot preach the kingdom of god without the signs and wonders following the lord confirms the word that was preached and if they do not preach the word there is nothing to confirm if you only preach repentance and salvation through jesus christ then he can only confirm that but if you have seen the word of god that healing casting out demons resurrection of the dead raising dead bodies is possible then god can confirm that too so at this time you know god stirred my heart and i believe i am doing it at the direction of god i am fully persuaded and god has told me that if i do not quit preaching teaching and myself uh, you know ministering resurrection to the people who have died the resurrections will become a daily occurrence lord be it done unto me and the people who are hearing according to your word which you have said let them be a daily occurrence hallelujah thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you lord jesus shabaron dala mandri akhiala mandri Rukata shakirin de kibron dala mahoto shundoro maria la mormanda la botro maria kala kibron dala kanda shandara mandoro koto shundoro mor 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 let me go to john chapter 11 please journey with me to john chapter 11 i want to show you something okay just to summarize what i said till now obedience is not an option so raising the dead is not an option it is something that is expected of you if you say you are a disciple of the lord jesus then you are expected to observe keep perform everything that jesus told the early apostles to do this is for a common believer a layman or you know layman was introduced by religious Uh, powers in the church layman the distinction between layman and clergy there is no such distinction you know peter says that we are royal priesthood we are a nation of royal priests and there is only one high priest the lord jesus rest of all of us we are priests kings lords under his lordship so john chapter 11 you know the story lazarus dies and mary martha sent to jesus and says lord please come he has died and the moment jesus comes there um the moment jesus comes there i believe it's martha it martha says lord if you had been here he would not have died well that is true you know jesus would have healed him and he, he would not have died but let's see what he says now uh 11 john chapter 11 verse 21 
Martha said unto Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Hallelujah. So was she really believing for Lazarus' resurrection? We're going to see as we go on. So Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise. So what happens here? You know, I want to go to the annotate screen now. I just want to uh, show you something. Okay. I don't know how many people are able to see me. Um, okay. So I'm assuming that you're able to see this. So Lazarus died here and this is where Jesus has come. Now what's happening here is the moment Jesus came, Mary is saying that Lord, I know whatever God, you can ask God, he is going to give you. And then when Jesus said, your brother shall rise, she puts it in the future tense. Okay, right over here, the last day. She puts it in the last day. She pushes it to the future. So she's saying, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection of the last day. But Jesus says unto her, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, I'm just thrilled. Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection in the life. So this last day, you know, this very last day that Martha was waiting for, Jesus is saying, I am that now. Praise God. Not last day. Do not wait for a last day. Are you waiting for a last day? He's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. So what is the answer of Jesus for someone who is believing for a futuristic last day? He's saying, I am. Okay, not I'm going to be. Not I'm going to be. He's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. So while it was true that Lazarus would have been raised on the last day, but the Lord Jesus Christ, okay, the Lord Jesus brings this event that was supposed to be in the last day and now and gives them the foretaste of the resurrection of the dead. So at this moment, Jesus raises Lazarus. So in our mind also, you know, if you can receive the testimony that Jesus is showing us here today, when someone dies here in our timeline, you know, today maybe, or yesterday maybe, you know, when they die, we immediately push it to a future tense saying that, okay, someday is gonna rise. But let me ask you, is Jesus the same? Or has it changed? The Jesus Christ that walked the earth, has it turned into someone else once he's gone to heaven? Is he telling us today, okay, okay, yes, you need to wait for this last day. Is that what he's saying? The Bible says Hebrews. Hebrews clearly says, you know, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. And Malachi also says, God, does not change. He says, I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus is not come to do works, works, works. He came to display the nature of God. So every act that Jesus did, it displays the nature of God, which does not change. So if Jesus was willing to raise him that day, you need to understand that Jesus is willing to raise any person this day, today. He is the resurrection and the life. He's not going to be the resurrection and the life. He said, the resurrection you're waiting for, I am that resurrection. Moreover, if you see, you know, God says, I am the first. Jesus himself says in Revelation, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Okay, so let me just clear out these drawings here. So Jesus is saying, I am the first. Forgive my handwriting. And I am the last. And he's also saying, I am the Alpha. This only means, you know, because it was written in the Greek, Greek language. The first letter that they have is Alpha and the Omega is the last letter. You know, uh, so he's saying I am the Alpha and the Omega. So our timeline, you know, our physical timeline is all wrapped up only in this space. So God has consumed all the space and time. Hallelujah. Jesus, I, I heard someone say like this. Jesus Christ is the person, the place and the event, you know, in which God and man unite. I think it's really true. Okay. Okay. Now imagine this. Just look at the drawing. I hope God communicates 
amplifies what I'm saying and communicates. If here someone dies and you're waiting for this last day, you know, this last day, you need to understand this last day is also present here. Why? He's the first and the last. This resurrection, this resurrection, R stands for resurrection, that you're waiting for in a future tense. He's saying, I can bring it to you right now. I can bring it to you now. Why do you operate within the confines of time and space when I'm not limited by them? So we go on and see, you know, we just go on and see. So when Jesus actually uh, starts the process or initiates or desires to raise Lazarus from the dead, Martha says, Lord, he's been dead four days and he stinks already. So, you know, it was, she really was not believing for a resurrection. Maybe she was hoping, but she never thought it's possible. Then, but Jesus goes ahead and Jesus says, okay, move the stone. And when he says, Lazarus, come forth. The one that was dead, you know, was lifted by the power of God or the angels and brought to the very mouth of the, you know, grave. Then Jesus says, lose him and let him go. Okay, that same Jesus is alive. Let me tell you, maybe some people have doubt if the same Jesus is alive or he has transformed into someone else. Let me tell you, my dear friend, dear child of God, do not be deceived. Okay, this is the deception of the devil that the church, you know, has failed to understand the nature of God is life. There is no point where God ordains death into a person's life. James chapter 1 verse 13. You, know, you would do well to heed the scripture and you can save your life and the life of so many other people. James chapter 1 verse 13. Let no man say when he's tempted, I am tempted of the Lord or God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither does he tempt any man. So do you understand what he's talking about here? He's saying God cannot be tempted with evil. Death certainly falls in the category of evil. You can go and read the Old Testament. Sickness, disease, poverty, death were never listed as blessings. They were always under the curse or the judgment of the law or the condemnation that came through Adam. Okay, He cannot be tempted with evil, neither does it test. You know, the word tempt there is to test. So God is not testing anyone with sickness, disease or death. Okay, He cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts He any man with evil. Let me read the Amplified. This is amazing. Let no one say he is tempted. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted from God, for God is incapable of being tempted incapable of being tempted neither by tempted by what is evil and he himself tempts no one but every man you know continue with me that's not the end of the story but 14th verse but every man is tempted when he, he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed then when lust has conceived lust does not just mean uh, sexual desires you know lust just means a strong desire towards something fleshly in the context of this and enticed then when lust has conceived it brings forth sin okay what is the fruit of this temptation or testing it is sin so if you're telling me that god is testing you with sickness disease poverty or death then you must agree that god is testing you with sin or god is provoking you to sin so are you willing to take that stand because you know bible is very clear the wages of sin is death so if you're telling a dead person that god has tested him or tempting him and the process of death before the before death what happens sickness disease you know every sickness can lead to death if there is no immunity in your body so every sickness is a baby form of death so when you're saying god has made him sick or god is tempting him by making him sick you must unequivocally you know you must without denial also agree according to the scripture that god is leading them to sin so god is not only leading them to sin and that's leading them to death are you willing to take that stand because previously James has made it very clear God is incapable of being tempted with evil neither does it tempt any man with evil now see what's happening here when lust is conceived it brings forth sin and sin when it is finished it brings forth death okay I think I'm, I need to show you the timeline again okay I'm using a I'm, I'm making good use of the timeline I believe okay evil uh, 
you know evil temptation leads to sin leads to death we can simply say the mathematical formula is equal to so the moment you say god is testing someone with evil or even here you can say god is testing someone with evil or in the middle you know sickness forgive for my handwriting again sickness here i think with usage i'm going to get better with that again that so if let me change the color here if in any of these stages you know if any of these stages you say god is involved then i have nothing to say my friend the scripture itself rebukes you saying god cannot be tempted with evil god cannot be tempted with sin so the sin which is leading to sickness death and many other evil manifestations has not originated with god it has not originated with god okay god is not your problem it's the devil and your flesh your unrenewed carnal mind that's your problem okay so thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you lord yes yes thank you jesus okay so let me clear my drawing board and stop the sharing of the screen so what have we learned so far god has commissioned every one of you everyone that's listening to me everyone who believes in jesus christ and i should say even people who have not believed in jesus christ yet i believe god prompts them god inspires them to do things for example you know maybe doctors or other people who are trying to cure people by natural means i believe you know they work on the inspiration of god though it's a natural secular means but if they realize the spiritual power of god they can be much more effective is what i really believe okay so now who can raise the dead a disciple can raise the dead you can raise the dead so how can we raise the dead okay that's what we are going to see now let me just uh, quickly summarize hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 15 hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 15 is the basis for ministering the resurrection power of the lord jesus christ not just uh, the sole basis it's uh, one of the basis hebrews chapter 2 verse 14 15 It says for as much then or i'm going to read the amplified since therefore this his children share in the flesh and blood in the physical nature of human beings he himself in a similar manner partook of the same nature that by going through death by going through death he might bring to naught and make of no effect him who had the power of death that is the devil it's a revelation right now for you who was bringing death The New Testament revelation says it was the devil that was bringing death to the people not God okay it was somehow through different varied means the devil was the one that was ministering death to the people okay it was like he was serving it on a plate giving people to eat and people were gladly eating it but Jesus Christ destroyed him now the amplified says brought that he through death he might bring him to naught and make of no effect him who had the power of death katargio is the greek word it means unemployed render idle bring to naught paralyzed disarmed you know all these meanings so the bible is telling you now today jesus jesus is revealing through his apostles today to us that the devil was the person who was bringing death to people and he has been disarmed he has been brought to naught he has been destroyed kjv says he does not have the power that he might he once had it's okay the devil is defeated and he cannot you know uh, have the same power to bring death today and he's saying 15th verse not only did jesus destroy the devil that also he might deliver and completely set free all who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives on the one hand he destroyed the devil that was exercising a uh, power of death and on the other hand he set people free from the fear of death so how can you and i be free today from fear of death okay just see what is saying the one who was bringing death has been destroyed 
and he has set us free from the power of death. That's the word of God, my friend. These are not man's thoughts, my thoughts, my preaching, my idea. I'm reading to you from the scripture. Okay, so Jesus is risen. He is the Lord. He is victorious. And he has defeated the devil who was enforcing death. Now, Revelation. Or let me, before we go to Revelation, let's go to Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission scripture. So why are we going, uh, you know, to do all these things? It is, it is because Jesus is risen and he has given us the responsibility, the command to preach the gospel and raise the dead. Verse 18, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Amplified, Jesus approached and breaking the silence said to them, All authority, all power of rule in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. So someone said, What does all mean? And the reply came, It means all. When Jesus is saying, All power, all authority, all power to rule is given unto me, that means the devil has no authority or power. You need to let that sink in, my dear brothers and sisters. Exousia is the word, Greek word that is used there. It means the liberty of choice, the jurisdiction, the legal right. You know, the authority is what he's talking about. So if Jesus has all authority, the devil has none. Okay? It's something like this. 100 minus 0 is equal to 100. If Jesus has 100% of the power, then the devil has 0% of that power. He's saying all authority where? Not just in heaven. Heaven and earth is given unto the Lord Jesus. And if we go in his, his authority, you know, he says, go therefore. So go therefore, that command, that exhortation is based on the truth that he has all authority. So I just want you to take a moment and let that sink in. So this means that no matter if a person sins or no matter if a person does any other activity like what we may think for example we may think that if someone worships idols or someone does spiritism worships the spirits then the spirits might have authority over them no no let me give you an example just think about it if a person houses a terrorist does that mean you know, the terrorist has authority to be in that house. By the constitution of the state, he is an outlaw. And no matter if, if he's living in a private property, the police is going to raid and be able to capture him and, you know, imprison him or prosecute him. So just because someone has harbored a terrorist in their house, does not mean that they are valid or legal. We can say that's an illegal operation. So what the devil has been doing in the earth today is illegal operation. But you and I are the ones with the legal power, legal rights, legal jurisdiction. We are the ones that the constitution of heaven is backing to do these things. We hear people say he might have done certain acts which caused his death. Or he might have lived a sinful life because of which the devil gained entrance. But you need to understand, just because someone did something wrong, let's talk about drug dealing. You know, if, if some young people were dealing in drugs and the drug dealers kidnap them, does that mean the drug dealers have legal right to hold them there? I don't think so. Neither does the constitution think so. The police are going to arrest the drug dealer and as well as the person who was getting involved in that. But the beauty of the gospel is that we are able to cast out the drug dealer, which is the devil. And we are going to minister the gospel to the person who was involved in those things. We are going to heal him. We are going to preach the gospel to him. We are not going to coerce them to believe. Okay, We preach the gospel because coercion does not cause faith. We, we demonstrate the kingdom of God and preach the good news to them. And if they are able to receive, they are going to get converted. And because of that testimony, they can also become disciples and start doing the same for other people. Okay, I hope those two examples might help you. So no matter what someone has done, the devil does not have a legal right in anyone's life. So when they are in your presence, you can cast out demons. The spiritism, people who do spiritism, host spirits in their body. You know, the witchcraft people, 
you we may think that because they have a covenant with the spirits that they can be manifesting in your presence no when you are there or they are in your presence you have power and authority over these demons to cast them out matthew chapter 10 uh, in the beginning right in the beginning you see it says i give you all power oh to cast out every demon to heal every sickness so when Jesus says he has all authority, it is unquestionable authority. The devil can never or demons or sickness, disease or death should not be able to tell us any time saying that, no, we are not going to go. No, Jesus has authority and I'm operating in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, you will go. Remember what I told you about casting out demons? It's like catching someone by the neck and pushing them out. It's a harsh word and you will see every time it says Jesus rebuked that spirit saying come out or be muscled, be gagged. So it was always a harsh censure that Jesus was doing. You can, you can check out the root word meanings there. So when he says all authority, you know, the authority over sickness, the authority over demons, the authority over death is also included. The authority over tornadoes. The raging of the seas, raging of the winds, you know, authority over germs, it's authority over everything. When he says all authority, there is nothing that is uh, kept out of his control. On this point, let me quickly read Hebrews chapter 2 verse 8. So till now you have understood that you are commissioned. Now you are understanding the power behind the commission. Hebrews chapter 2. I'm going to read the Amplifier here, verse 7 and 8. For some little time you have ranked him lower and inferior to the angels, talking about Jesus. You have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. For you have put everything in subjection under his feet. Do you see the terminology, the phraseology there? You have put everything in subjection under his feet. Meaning what? There is nothing that is not subject to Jesus. Take the demons, sickness, disease, death, germs, tornadoes, earthquakes, the sky, the earth, the waters, the winds, demons, devil. Name what you want. It says everything has been subjected unto him. The word subjected means, you know, they are, uh, they are put in obedience to him. So when Jesus commands something or says something, it has to happen. They do not have an option of refusal. Hallelujah. That's an amazing revelation right there. When it says Jesus is Lord, this is what it means. Lord means kurios in the Greek. Who is a Lord? A Lord is someone who is absolute owner of something, who has total authority over something. So Jesus is Lord over all, includes everything. The dominion of death, sickness, disease, demons, devils is not accepted accepted out of this lordship okay jesus has power over those things he is lord over all these things so it is saying there is nothing for you have put everything in subjection under his feet and he amplifies now now in putting everything in subjection to man he left nothing outside of man's control so this man was jesus christ okay he goes on to say but at the present we do not see all things subjected to man but we are able to see Jesus, who was ranked lower than the angels for a little while, crowned with glory, honor, because of his having to suffer death, in order that by the grace, unmerited favor of God, to us sinners, he might experience death for every individual person. Somehow, this is again bringing in death. You know, he tasted death for every person. The, the same verse that talks about everything is subjected to Jesus, also talks about he tasting death for us. So are you able to see this big picture now? Everything is subject to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. Because we are specifically talking about raising the dead. Okay, if you understand these concepts, you can also heal the sick. Healing the, healing the sick is nothing special. Raising the dead is nothing special to the Lord. It's all the same for Him. It is our natural understanding that breaks things down and says, okay, this is difficult. If it's God's power that's doing it, so it's time we stop dividing the different acts of God and labeling them as easy acts and hard acts.
Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 amplified or 17 18 when I saw him I fell at his feet as if dead but he laid his right hand on me and said do not be afraid I am the first and the last and the ever living one I am living in the eternity of eternities I died but see I am alive forevermore and I possess the keys of death and Hades the realm of the dead so what does he want us want us to see today he's saying see I have the keys what do the keys denote keys denote controlling authority what can a person who holds the key do he can open something or he can shut something he can open a door or shut a door okay he can cause something to come into effect or you know or the, or the vice versa so when he's saying i hold the keys of death and hades we need to better believe jesus christ we need to stop believing that the devil has those keys we think the devil can kill and we cannot raise someone from the dead john 10 10 he the thief only comes to steal kill and destroy but i have come to give you life i think it's time we see this as well on the you know on the whiteboard we need to see this dividing line okay thief it's definitely the devil and jesus thief comes to steal And kill. Destroy. This was the first uh, zooming directly from Zoom onto FB Live, but I'm going to practice and get good at the writing on the screen. I was saying life. Jesus said, I'm come to give them life and that life in abundance. Okay, can you see that? If you can see the difference between the two, whatever falls into the left category, stealing, killing, destroying, you need to know it's not from Jesus. It's not from the Lord God. It's not from Father. It's from the devil. It is a work of the devil. Somehow he was able to bring it in somebody's life. But what would Jesus do? Jesus would bring life. See, for all these left side problems, the answer is life. Life has come through the Lord Jesus Christ today. So now when he's saying, I have the keys of death and Hades, that should give us great confidence that Jesus possesses that keys. And he said, I have all authority. So death is not legal at any point of time, even if the death was caused through a sinful act. Okay, just think about it. Someone was involved in adultery and uh, and the, the other person's partner found out and they killed this person. Still, death is not the will of God. You know what is the will of God? That that person must repent and come to relationship with Jesus Christ. That is God's solution. Killing is not God's solution. The transformation of a person is God's solution. So you can raise them from the dead. And once they are raised, they will realize who God is and what God has done for them. And I, I'm, I'm totally sure okay, that they will accept the Lord Jesus Christ and they will come to the realization that, you know, the way of Jesus is the true way and a better way to live. So when he says, I have the keys of death and Hades, let me tell you, two days back, or I think it was just yesterday, as I was thinking on these things, I received an understanding in my spirit and I am persuaded this is from God. Death, let me just clear this board. Okay, I'm having some trouble here. Death and the other word is Hades. The word Hades is also most of the times translated as grave. Okay, this has a great historical significance. Let me just hold that thought there. Let me read Hosea chapter 13 verse 14.
Okay, I would request you to turn with me as well. Hosea chapter uh, 13 verse 14. I will ransom them. Just give me a moment here, please. Okay, he says, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. The word there is Sheol, which is New Testament equivalent to Hades. Sheol and Hades both mean the same thing, the grave and beyond. You know, it is the realm of the unseen because people could not see what happens to someone after the grave. You know, after uh, they go, they are buried. That's how the terminology was formed, the underworld, the netherworld. So they, the word Hades uh, or Sheol means the grave and beyond. So he's saying, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. Oh death, I will be your plagues. Oh grave, I will be your destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine. Now, you know, the uh, watered down translations will translate it the other way and turn it around a question. But I would request you to, you know, go for literal translations like KJV, a Young's Literal Translation, Apostolic Bible Polyglot, and like that, you know, likewise. So here he's talking about that God himself will become grave's plague. And we see Jesus rising again and saying, I have the keys of death and grave. The better translation there would be grave. So death is for someone who has died. You know, when Jesus talks about these two things, uh, death and Hades, there's someone who has died for them death and someone whose body has been corrupted is saying the Hades or the grave. So when Jesus, you know, just to put it as a bottom line, you know, give a summary of what I'm saying here on this verse. When Jesus said, I have the keys of death and Hades or death and the grave. It means that for the person who has died and has not been corrupted yet in the grave, you can raise them. I have power over that death. But if a person is buried and the body has been corrupted in the grave, I have also the key of that. I have the key of the grave, the Hades, that their body can be redeemed from the corruption. This should give you great comfort. People who have been grieving for loved ones who have gone past for a long time. There are so many instances. Uh, you know, if you see Jesus' resurrection itself, Matthew chapter 27, and demonstration of this thing. While Jesus was walking on the earth, he raised people from the death who died. That falls in the first category, case of death. And when Jesus was risen again, and we see that the graves were open, that's the second category, keys of the grave and beyond, keys of Hades, keys of, you know, uh, the realm of the dead. Matthew chapter 27, verse 52. Or 51 and behold the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many so the graves were opened at the death of jesus but when jesus rose again they all were raised from the dead you know, their bodies that were corrupted in the grave, those were restored. So when Jesus is saying, I have the power of, uh, of the keys of death and graves, you know, the death and grave, this is what he's talking about. Not only can you raise people who have died recently, but the people whose body has been corrupted from the grave, they can be raised again from the dead too. I know this is hard to believe for someone, but let me ask you, who is it hard for? for you or for the Lord. Let's go through the timeline again. I praise God. I thank uh, my friend Jim John. You know, he's the person who paid for the Zoom. Uh, he took a month subscription and allowed me the opportunity to be able to use the screen. So this is the timeline, okay? B for beginning, E for end, or we can say alpha and omega here. Okay, at the end, right at the end. So, people died here. Okay, maybe this is not 2021. 
and you want to say that they all will be raised at the last day is that what we want to say okay but do you remember john chapter 11 what did jesus answer saying he said i am the resurrection and the life he said i am the resurrection and the life Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So this resurrection that you've been waiting for, this resurrection of your loved ones that you've been waiting for is available now. The God who is able to compose back their bodies and raise them from the dead again, is he not able to do it now? So you need to, you know, take that verse, pray, ask God for yourself. Am I telling the truth? Come to your own understanding, revelation. So when he says, I have the keys of death and grave, that is, that's what he's talking about. Do not be discouraged if your loved ones have been corrupted in the grave and the bodies have gone and decomposed. He has the keys, the controlling authority, the power over the grave. Hallelujah. Jesus has power over death, power over grave. And he says, go therefore, you go in my name, in my power, my authority, and go preach the kingdom of God. Say the kingdom of God is at hand. Heal the sick, cast out demons, raise the dead. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And he's saying, freely you have received, freely give. You were given the power to raise the dead freely. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you. I feel the power of God so strong upon me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Okay, I'm going to stop it at this time now. I will try to come back tomorrow again, same time. And okay, today we discussed and understood the commission to raise the dead. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about the power we have to raise the dead. Okay, because commission is of no use if you don't have the power to raise the dead. So I will expound on topics like uh, receiving the power to raise the dead, uh, common hindrances to raising the dead, and how to raise the dead. What are the scriptural precedents to raising the dead? Okay. Because I want to stick to one hour. I don't want to prolong it more. I pray. Oh, Father God, thank you. I pray every person that has heard today that they are inspired, they are provoked, that they have understood that, yes, God is alive. Jesus is the same today. If he did it yesterday, he's going to do it today as well. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let the word that you have spoken concerning power over death and the grave be loosed as a revelation of God because I have not heard anyone else speak. I pray that you will confirm this revelation. Thank you, Jesus. Your word, this is your word, Lord Jesus. I pray that these people are empowered to raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out demons, and preach the kingdom of God with all boldness. And thank you that you confirm your word by signs and wonders following. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So I'm going to be ending this uh, stream right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Be blessed, my dear friends. And if you would like to connect with me, you know, we have a small uh, group, small WhatsApp group where we are actively praying for the resurrection of people who have died. So if you would like to join join that group, you can just drop me a personal message and uh, I will get back to you. Thank you.